Hi everybody, this is Robin for Chess24 and in this video I'm going to be covering the first game of the World Chess Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin. Let's get to it. Magnus opened with d2, d4, a move that um, when I was commentating this match together with my friend Eric Hansen for the Chess24 live broadcast did not come to us as a surprise. However, after knight f6, which doesn't quite tell us yet what Karyakin's preparation is against uh, the common move c4 over here uh, that a lot of people have been speculating about. Um, Magnus already opted for a move that must have shocked pretty much everybody uh, who was um, thinking about the opening play in this match. He went for bishop g5. Obviously this Trompovsky opening is not so common at the top level. Um, there are a couple of strong players like Mama Jarov, one of actually Sergei Karyakin's seconds who adopt this system quite often, but at the very top level it's a rare move, especially in um, classical time controls. And some of our viewers even suggested that it might be a tribute to the freshly elected um, US president. So there's a lot of speculation about this opening choice, but let's just get to the chess. Um, Karyakin didn't go for the main line with knight e4, but for the most solid move, which is d5. Of course, white can take here on f6 when black will play e takes f6 and play solidly. Uh, normally, he follows up with moves like bishop d6, c6, and castle short. Um, Magnus played probably what is considered to be most testing option e3 over here. And Karyakin played the main line with c5. Knight to e4 is another major option here. And what is interesting is that uh, recently, in tournament play, Magnus has been testing the London system with bishop f4 quite a lot. And of course, this resembles the London system um, quite a bit. Of course, the difference is, however, that the knight on e4 um, is, well, at least differently placed uh, than in the classical London system where it's on f6. So even though Karyakin may have prepared for that system, he wasn't fully comfortable playing this version of it, uh, if you will, and decided to go for the other main move, c5. <clears throat> Magnus took on f6 now. I personally played e takes f6 here once against Luke van Weyle, which was not a very successful attempt. Um, although it is playable, black does have to reconcile with the fact that very often his d pawn will be isolated here. And um, it is a logical choice that uh, Karyakin went for the more natural g takes f6, intending to just create a big center with knight c6 and e5. And because play is so easy for black here, um, generally white should not go for a classical slav setup over here with knight e2 and c3. For example, if you were to play c3 here, knight c6, knight f3, already e5 looks quite promising and um, quite good for black. So Magnus, uh, still being in his preparation over here, went for the move d takes c5, and uh, Karyakin played knight c6, bishop to b5, and here, this is pretty much the first moment that uh, Sergei, as black, uh, started thinking for, I think it was a good 20 minutes. Um, clearly he was not completely familiar with the position anymore, or at least he couldn't quite remember his home uh, preparation. And in the end, although black has many interesting moves, such as, for example, rook to g8, attacking g2, or even forcing white to play a6, which might lead to some sort of a pawn sacrifice if white decides to hold on to this pawn, and later support this pawn with c3 if necessary, um, Sergei decided to go for the most natural option, which is e6. Now b4 might be an option here, but after a5, it does seem like at least white is somewhat underdeveloped and black should have good compensation. Instead, Magnus played the more natural c4, and obviously, um, before reacting, uh, before taking the pawn back on c5, black should probably react to this move as this position over here is not really desirable with the pawns being so split up and um, not having clear counterplay in the center as d4 is currently not possible due to the pin. So after c4, Karyakin played d takes c4, inviting a queen trade. Black shouldn't really fear a queen trade right now because he has the bishop pair and as we'll see later in the game, these double f pawns can become a weakness but it's not necessarily a real problem um, in the near future. Magnus actually played a novelty over here, played the move knight to d2. And uh, I personally was quite happy to see this move because it sort of introduces um, his, his spirit, I would say, towards this game, which is quite fighting. Um, not only is he um, not allowing a queen's exchange, he's also allowing black to cause some structural damage here with c3. For example, in the game, bishop takes c5 was played, but black could have opted for c3 here 
when after b takes c3, bishop takes c5, I would say that um, white's long-term positional prospects are probably worse than black's, uh, who only has some small issues around his king, whereas if we are to develop naturally in this type of position, let's imagine black gets his rooks out and his bishop out, then there will be a lot of pressure on the c-pawn potentially over the half-open c-file. So this pawn is actually a clear weakness. In return, however, white does get some play. For example, he, he gets access to the d4 square with his knight. And uh, of course, in, he would like to launch some sort of offensive against the black king. Unfortunately, Karyakin didn't opt for this quite ambitious choice and instead played the move bishop takes c5 first. Magnus still allows c3, uh, Karyakin castles, castles. And instead of playing c3 here, actually Sergei went for a move that was also suggested by Eric Hansen, um, the move knight to a5. A very solid move in my opinion because black is really saying that, well, I'm, I'm happy to exchange more pieces as I still have the bishop pair. And uh, again, changing queens is not something black minds. In fact, white played rook c1 over here, but had white played something like queen e2, black would have probably seriously considered forcing the exchange of the queen um, just to get an, an endgame, which should be pleasant for him. For example, here, once again, it's very hard to make use of these uh, pawns. In fact, all these, all these important uh, squares are currently covered. And uh, th one of the main ideas could be to get the bishop on the long diagonal by playing f5 and putting the bishop on f6 at some point. So <clears throat> this is not really desirable for white. After knight to a5, um, white played rook to c1, just developing. And here bishop to e7. Of course, a6 could be played too, but bishop e7 is arguably quite a clever move because the bishop, as I said, very often wants to return to e7 in order to progress with this plan f5 bishop f6 which not only will activate the bishop a lot it will also considerably uh, improve the black's king position as the bishop has more of a scope to defend the king here queen c2 was played now queen d3 probably isn't such a great move for example queen to a4 looks annoying attacking the knight and then later on capturing the pawn or maybe even putting the rook to d1 first so queen d3 not so effective now and to my mind, the most logical move here for black is a6. And I was quite surprised not to see this move being played by Sergei, uh, who opted for bishop to d7 instead. I think that after a6, bishop takes c4, knight takes c4, and for example, queen takes c4, bishop d7, surely white has some compensation uh, for basically the lack of the bishop pair um, in form of somewhat exposed king. But as I said before, these pawns are quite solid and black can more or less at his convenience play f5, bishop f6. So had this not been a world championship match, I think a lot of top players would have considered playing more ambitiously here as black. And why do I say more ambitiously? Well, as we'll see in the game, bishop to d7 in this position, first of all, immediately allows for a uh, trade of the bishop pair. And um, after queen c3, <clears throat> Magnus now quite um, nicely highlighted that there is a bit of a weakness on f6, as knight to e4 is quite an annoying threat. Now, for example, how could this work? First of all, the knight on a5 is under attack, so let's say we defend it with queen to b5. Um, knight to e4 here is something that we looked at, and after f5, it seems that everything is under control, but now knight f6 check really starts to um, bother black because as if he wants to move his king away this would immediately lose to either knight d7 check picking up the rook but probably even worse would be knight d5 check when the bishop will be lost so pretty much black has to take and even though he's a pawn up it seems to me that black has some serious issues here around the king for example how is he going to stop white from playing knight g5 and queen h6 threatening mate on h7 and also white might be able to reinforce his attack even further by some sort of rook lift over the fourth rank as white is uh, controlling d8 right now uh, which could be an important square so this is definitely not something black wants to opt for um, i do think black has some interesting choices such as king g7 here which is of course a little bit more risky but it does defend this these two pawns especially the f pawn and it's not immediately clear how much uh, compensation white has, although I do think that white should have sufficient compensation. Um, but as we'll see, Sergei really opted for a very solid choice here. Played the move queen to d5. 
And what it's basically saying is, okay, I don't want to allow any sort of knight e4 moves. Uh, also, sometimes the knight could be better placed on g3. Uh, and if you play e4 over here, that just sort of fails to impress because after queen to b5, this knight on d2 is really misplaced. And um, even queen e3, queen h6, it doesn't really uh, come with any threat for the moment. Also note that black is quite nicely defending this entire um, uh, row with his queen. And um, yeah, this, you know, white should be focusing already on winning his pawn back at this point, probably. So <laughs> after some thought, I think Magnus, somewhat disappointed at this point, um, decided to take on c4. And right now we can see that the game is heading to more technical uh, territory. And at first it looks like white has very little of an advantage over here. Because as I said earlier, if black managed to just go f5, bishop f6, he should be totally fine, and um, initially I thought this would be ending in a draw very soon, but it turns out that the simple threat of rook to c7 really holds black back from carrying out this plan. So in this position, black exchanged one pair of rooks, playing rook to c8, for now uh, stopping rook to c7. Obviously white doubled up, one rook was changed, and black plays rook to d8, again stopping the threat for now because a back rank mate is threatened on um, d1. And this is actually the point that uh, both Eric Hansen and I were thinking that Magnus is going to play a very instructive move, which is to move g4. However, <clears throat> the, the point of g4 is not that it's a bad move because it really does stop f5 for the moment. Um, the interesting thing is that Magnus opted for the move g3. Uh, one of the drawbacks of g4 could be that maybe black will be able to trade uh, pawns with h5 at some point. Imagine, for example, a scenario where uh, we would take this pawn. Now, here we still have to deal with the threat of rooks, rook to uh, c7, but in general, black could maybe slowly but surely just bring his king towards that pawn without really having weakened the rest of his, uh, of his position, maybe even f5, bishop f6, and... It's really arguable whether this pawn on, on h5 is, uh, you know, worth something because most likely black is gonna win it back and white will be left with a worse structure. At the same time, if you play h3 uh, at some point in this type of position, black will be able to change one pair of pawns and the the lower the amount of pawns in this type of position, the higher the drawing chances or, or, or the probability of making a draw fairly easily as black. So in instructed moments, because g4 feels very natural, but Magnus actually correctly judges that f5, bishop to f6 is very difficult to play regardless of g4 or not. So he goes for the more solid move g3, and this really keeps white's options open um, as, again, rook to c7 is uh, a threat. Note that the move king f1 also is interesting, but the main reason I think Magnus didn't go for this is that black can now be the first one to attack some pawns <coughs> and pretty much white is forced to somewhat passive defense here with rook to c2 and uh, of course that's not desirable um, the main point after g3 is that if you do the same thing of course taking on b2 no longer comes with a check as the king is not on e2 so rook c7 now actually wins the pawn um, on uh, with wins at least one pawn for example after bishop to b4 takes takes the pawn on a7 is still hanging so this seems to be all good for white. Of course, black is not going to give up a pawn. Karyakin just played rook to d7, now king to f1. Still rook d1 check, king g2 is safe. <clears throat> f5 is played now. And it turns out that this move f5 actually doesn't really solve black's problems quite yet. Um, Magnus goes b3. <clears throat> One of the main ideas that we see is after king f8, bringing the king closer to the center h3 that white still has some somewhat of an edge when if he manages to go g4 and unfortunately we didn't actually see uh, magnus carry this plan out in the game and we'll get to that as well um, but one of the main ideas is that if you go g4 and you change those those pawns it will still be the case that white pawns are somewhat more united if you will um, and black still has this this isolated h pawn uh, meaning that white's pawn structure is still a bit better, but more importantly, white frees up a very nice square on e4 for his knight. Now, Karyakin plays a waiting move h6 over here, 
It's important to note that h5 uh, would be answered with knight e1. And this simply is a bit of a weakness, as for example, knight d3, knight f4 would target this pawn. And uh, if you decide to stop uh, knight f4 with the, the bishop, for example, here, then you have to deal with the fact that the rook might be able to swing over as you're no longer protecting the h4 square with the bishop. So a couple of subtleties over here that um, Karyakin really had to account for, and his move h6 is probably the best move. And the strange thing is that Magnus here was not consistent with his plan. Uh, we really expected him to play g4, after which an exchange would be normal, because obviously black does not want to allow some sort of isolated double pawn. Uh, so takes, takes, and imagine, let's say king to e7, now knight to d2, and really this, this still seems quite promising for white, as he can play knight e4, maybe gain some more space with f4, and it is typically the type of position uh, like this, where black is of, of course not much worse, but also it's, it's hard for him to really equalize by force, um, and Magnus tends to excel at this type of position, where he can slowly but surely put pressure, and uh, we were already predicting some sort of very bad scenario for Karyakin, where he's suffering a lot in this game, and um, it could be it could be quite an endless task to defend this um, if if White, you know, plays this very gradually and sort of tries out different plans as long as he keeps the control over sort of the the, the first second rank so that the rook cannot enter. Okay, as I said, this was actually not played. Magnus decided to go knight e1 now, <coughs> which is Simply strange because the knight on d3 just doesn't seem to be as strong of a piece uh, in combination with g4. e4 really is a more dominant square. Karyakin simply brought the king to the center. Uh, knight to d3, king to d8. More or less introducing the idea of exchanging the rooks. And really the, the, the amount of pressure in this position should be reduced a lot once the rooks are off. Um, I do think that without the rooks the drawing margin is just very high as there's no... Again, no easy way for white to attack the pawns, and more pawn exchanges, of course, leads to a higher drawing tendency. Uh, here I still expected to see g4, but obviously it's not as dangerous. I would even say that this type of position isn't, isn't that impressive anymore. <clears throat> Instead, f4 was played, and also this move didn't really um, impress me too much, although maybe Magnus sort of spoiled most of his advantage. Uh, this doesn't help either because now black actually very cleverly played h5, a very good move by Sergei Karyakin. Just highlighting like, well, basically those two ideas we've seen earlier, rook to h4 and knight f4 are both stopped by this move f4. Um, and what f4 really does for white, well, maybe g4 could have still been played had black not gone h5 and also maybe e5 was stopped. But then again, e5 doesn't really seem like a move that black really wanted to play to begin with, because it could, for example, hurt the f5 pawn in the long run. And also e5, e4 might look active, but it doesn't immediately achieve something. So f4, really not an easy move to explain. h5, good defensive move. Um, a4 was played, again, somewhat empty move. <clears throat> Rook d5. It is noteworthy that <clears throat> the immediate rook c7 here looks a little tricky. Um, the following line is forced when um, black is more or less forced to take on e5 because the f7 pawn is hanging. And as I said, of course, black would like to exchange the rooks, but the end game that ensues over here looks very tricky because um, basically white is going to play h4, and at some point he wants to play e4 and g4, start running with this h pawn. Now, this end game has to be properly analyzed, but the main idea is that maybe at some point black will be forced to go into uh, the queen side with his king, as there's not many moves left for both sides, and then white might be the first one to promote. So also not really worth calculating, perhaps. Uh, if you're not feeling like you're in that much trouble with black, why would you have to try to you know, put all eggs in one basket and, and risk uh, losing in a very long line when you can simply you know, continue with your old strategy, which is just to hold on? which is what Karyakin did. He went rook d5, knight to c5 was played. And really not much is going on here. b6, knight to a6. Now, of course, you have to be a little bit careful with rook c7 coming in, but <clears throat> Karyakin played this well, played bishop to e7. Now of rook c7, I believe that simply b5 um, was a good move. Um, 
or sorry, uh, rook to c7, even easier is just to, to play rook to d7, of course, just defending against the threat. Um, <clears throat> so instead, uh, knight to b8 was played, funny move that also came to my mind, um, but a5, again, just very solid. Black doesn't really have enough weaknesses to make something out of this. Knight c6 check, king e8. And here knight e5 was played. The only really tricky line, in my opinion, is knight takes e7, king takes e7, rook c8. Because again, you don't really want to go for an endgame where your king will be pressed all the way to the back rank, and white's king might start running. So the easier way to defend this, um, obviously white's main idea would be rook to h8, taking the pawn. But black can play b5 over here, and it really shouldn't be a problem. For example, rook to h8, takes, takes, rook to c5, and after taking rook to c4, he will pick up the a pawn, and uh, this really shouldn't be any problem. <coughs> the, the, pawn, the material counts equal again. So in this position, Magnus tried knight to e5, but honestly, this is more or less the moment where I would say Karyakin fully equalized, and um, after a few more logical moves, um, the rooks were traded, Karyakin played f6, just kicking the knight away from his knight outpost on e5. Magnus tried knight c6 check. And the only tricky thing that really happened here is that there is a funny threat of knight c7 check, followed by knight e8 and knight g7 that you want to stop. So, for example, some, something really silly here would be to play bishop b4, because that would allow just that when, for example, this pawn is hanging. You'd have to go bishop e7, and then you would still lose at least your h pawn. Um, or even worse, your epon. But of course, Karyakin being a very tenacious defender didn't fall for anything of this sort. Just played king c6, <clears throat> Magnus played check, and um, instead of taking over here, uh, the players actually repeated after king d6, check, king d7, knight d4, king d6. So that was the game. As you could see at the last stage, really Karyakin never was in any major trouble. Um, a couple of interesting things. First of all, a very odd opening choice by Magnus, the Trompovsky, which really didn't pose Karyakin any major problems in my opinion. I do think Karyakin played a little bit unambitious, which led him to get into a slightly worse endgame. But then again, Magnus seemed to be right on track to actually um, really get something out of that position. And I'm sp speaking specifically once again about the moment over here where he introduced this idea of g4 followed by 92 94 uh, with slight but you know long lasting pressure but then when magnus didn't go for this plan it really petered out quite quickly and koryakin defended without any major problems so what can we say about this game this was a pretty good start for sergey koryakin who quite confidently defended um, a somewhat unpleasant position against magnus uh, magnus opening doesn't impress me i'm pretty sure this was a one-time weapon i don't think we'll be seeing the trompovsky again in this match um, that also means that we don't have major information about koryakin's opening choices so um, right now all we can say this was a decent start for sergey magnus will be a bit annoyed with himself not making the most out of this game and tomorrow of course a very important day when probably we're going to see some more theoretical battle as uh, Sergei Karakin will be playing with white and trying to make the most out of um, all the opening work that of course he's done in preparation for this match. I hope you like this analysis, let me know what your thoughts are and I hope you can tune in in the live broadcast the coming days that Chess24 does to cover the match. Uh, thank you for watching, this was Robin for Chess24.